I'm Igor Kafetz, and this is The List Building Lifestyle, a podcast for anyone who wants to build a wildly profitable email list working from home. If you'd like to make six figures, travel the world, and help people improve their lives in the process, then this podcast is for you. I also invite you to attend a free workshop at igor.ac where I'm teaching how I made $21,779.45 in affiliate commissions by sending just 481 clicks to my affiliate link in one day. I'm also explaining why I walked away from ClickBank and I don't promote ClickBank offers anymore, as well as the five things I look for in the perfect affiliate offer. I'm even going to show you the one-page website that I used to make over half a million dollars in affiliate commissions this year, and I'll even bribe you to attend this workshop by giving you a $497 value course that shows you how to cherry-pick high-converting affiliate offers for your next affiliate promotion. In addition, I'll even give you the three offers I'm promoting right now that are making me money as we speak. All that and more at igor.ac. And now, it's time to claim your list building lifestyle. Once again, it's that time for the List Building Lifestyle Show. My name is Terrence Lackey, your co-host, and I'm proud and honored to be here with my friend, Igor Kafetz. How are you doing, Igor, my man? Doing great. Doing great. Can't wait uh, to uh, to launch into this one. We've got an amazing conversation. Um, it just and it's it's I'm tr- I'm sure we're going to hit in some points here, um, some pain points for some people, and I'm pretty sure that by the time we're done here, some people going to subscribe from the podcast. You'll see. <laughs> yeah, I know. I look, you, you shared this one with me. I, I, I can definitely let me tell you my my quick story is, uh, you know, I, I am terrified of buying cars. I cannot go into a dealership, uh, uh, whether it's a dealership or a regular used car sales uh, sales place or some other place. Uh, I hyperventilate because I think they're all like vultures ready to get me. And uh, so I think I'm going to be scammed. I've been scammed in the past, but I've had some good experiences, but the bad ones always leave a bad taste in my mouth. So, you know, you know, I'm worried about being scamming, but I, I'm obviously there to buy a car. I'm, I'm, I want someone to sell something to me. So Igor, what's the difference? What's the difference between being sold to or, or being scammed? Well, for one, I'd like to start the, the conversation with the idea that you can't sell someone something they don't want. Like you can't push something that on, on a person that they don't genuinely want to have. So the whole idea of scamming um, only is only limited to the fact that are they telling you the truth about what you're buying? That's it. So, and and I can and I can resonate with what you're saying about car dealers because uh, I remember uh, last time I went to a car dealership, I was looking at a Lexus, and um, the the reason for that is because I need to get out of my lease for my Buick, which is the second car we own, um, and I like it. Although I know Buick is for old people, I like my Buick. Um, you know, it's just a really good car for the value, value for the money. Everything's great, but needed to get out of the lease for some reasons. And um, I went to to a Lexus dealership where this guy Archie basically tried to sell me a Lexus, and you know. He was so friendly and he was so sweet that um, not buying a car would almost be insulting to how sweet he is. And eventually we got to a point where he calculated everything and uh, he sent me off to the fi- financial office, you know, the office where they, um, you know, upsell you with like inter- term insurance and things like that. Yeah, you got to have the extended warranty. I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, my sales defenses were down by this point because they were always up with with Archie. And I was like, OK, done deal. The price is good. And I went to that office and she started like she basically added another 200 bucks on top of whatever Archie kind of summed up for me. Um, and I was furious. I went back to Archie to cancel the deal. Um, Archie locks me in his office and he starts telling me how this is all bullshit and how they're trying to upsell you with stuff you don't need and this and that. And, you know, I was obviously more likely to believe Archie because he's not my friend, right? I I mean, I spent three hours with the guy, so we're almost practically family, you know? (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) and eventually as it turned out, I went back home and I slept on it. Um, I really did need the term insurance because if I got into an accident, I had a big gap that I wasn't covered. And Archie was just literally bad mouthing his colleague 
uh, because he knew the sale was in jeopardy uh, just to get me to say yes, even though I would be, you know, uh, taking on this risk. So for me, that was manipulation. That's why I called off the deal. But you see, that's that's an exception to the rule. For the most part, people who sell you stuff, they are good people with good intentions and they don't come from a place of of manipulation. They don't come from a place of, you know, um, scamming you. They're just making a living and they truly believe in their product. And that's why they are, you know, making a, a, a really powerful case for what they're selling. Because I don't know, again, for me, whenever I offer someone one of uh, my systems to help them build a list, to help them make money, you know, I'm, I'm labeled automatically as a scammer. I don't know if you know that, Terrence, but a while back, um, uh, Dennis invited me uh, to like a home party where there were some people there that, that he became friends with that somehow were related to his uh, extended family. Basically, so, you know, some people that we were supposed to not be friends with. And as it turned out, it like it was his like third attempt, I think, to bring me in because the first two attempts got shut down because those people thought I'm a scammer because they heard my name, Googled my name. They're like, oh, he sells make money stuff. Oh, crap. He's a scammer. Done. Bye. Right. I, so I was I was labeled a scammer even before I had a chance to vindicate myself. Um, but for me, the reason I do what I do is quite simple. Um, anytime I put together a new offer, write a new email, or uh, do anything, I remember the old Igor, Igor who was 18 years old, and just stumbled across an online, uh, just a page, it's a web page, where you know people were bragging about making money on the internet, making 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 a month. So to me at the time, I couldn't even afford the product, so I didn't buy it. But the mere idea the mere exposure to a different set of thinking, the exposure to the sales argument they were making, regardless of whether it was true or not, put me on a path to total life transformation and pursuing a uh, quote-unquote career, even though I, it's hard to call it a career, but to pursue this uh, 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 you know, way to make a living on the internet, which then resulted in a, in a ripple effect and, uh, you know, on, on several generations in my family, a uh, bunch of my friends, a bunch of my students and their communities and their families. So, again, just being exposed to the sales argument. That's it. I didn't even buy the product. I was simply reading the sales pitch. And that alone got me so excited about the idea that you can make money without leaving your home and using your computer that it changed everything for me. So there is value in, in your marketing. And I don't think people truly recognize that. No, yeah, I, I agree completely. You know, this kind of you, you you saying that, and and we we're talking about the used car salesman, and then they wouldn't talk to you because they 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 thought that you're going to sell them something. Kind of brought me back to my days when I was uh, I was actually an army recruiter, and it was my job to actually go out and talk to mainly. You know, we tried to talk to young people who hadn't picked the direction for their lives, and um, you know, and offer them the options of uh, of the military. And you know, my job as a recruiter was to simply uh, locate them and uh, see if they're interested in hearing about what that kind of career choice would mean for them and, you know, what, what it would look like, you know. And um, there was a lot of myths out there and a lot of people – and it's essentially, you know, all of my training while I was recruiting was basically sales training, you know, uh, how to overcome objections, how to present features and benefits and how to close the sale. Uh, and, 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 um, and, you know, all I was doing at the time was uh, really just – you know, showing them my product, showing them the features and benefits and seeing if that's something that they wanted to buy. Uh, but then there's also a stigma, right? There's a stigma where people think that you're out to get them. And there's some bad apples in the bunch that, that may say things that are untrue. Uh, but that's when you have uh, – that's with anything in life. Um, you have ethical people and you have you have non-ethical people. Now, I'm not saying there's non-ethical people in the military. They definitely are trained to be honest and, and to set right expectations because you know, we, by, by, it's the law, it's the government. You got to definitely, uh, you know, you don't, don't want to manipulate or, or, but you can tap into people's desires and their wants. Uh, and, and, you know, if they're looking for an education, they're looking for adventure, they want to 
serve their country because everybody in their in their family has served their country. It's something you could tap into. And I think the used car salesman or the, the car salesman or anybody else in a sales position can definitely um, – relate to that. But you got to, you got to make your, my first objection, my first thing to overcome was just to get them to understand that, you know, I'm there to help them and to get, show them of something of benefit and value, but you got to get past that stigma. So I can, I can definitely relate to that. You know, I, I'm happy you brought that example, uh, because, uh, back in 2008, when, um, uh, maybe not 2008, but there was, it was uh, a few years after 9-11, when there was probably a spike in uh, people wanting to go to Iraq, right, and and go fight, um, um, they the the army released uh, a, a series of postcards that got some bad press, and they were labeled uh, opportunistic and manipulative, and uh, one of them, one of the postcards, had like a, a really sexy babe on it, and uh, it, it it said in writing, "I got some maneuvers to show you when you get home." Right. So, (laughs) so you really think about that. Is it manipulative? Yeah, probably is. But um, is it like necessary when you're getting uh, people to go and risk their life uh, for the sake of protecting the hundreds of millions of people who stay home? Probably. Yeah. And, you know, as a father, I have to admit that I've become more manipulative over the years with my daughter. Um, and I will be very manipulative with my son. In fact, I learned that just, you know, communicating straight up with my kids, it just doesn't work. You can't tell Erica, please eat your broccoli. No, but you can bribe Erica with chocolate in favor of eating a few broccolis. You can, you know, uh, I'm actually working on a comic right now. Uh, I'm developing a series of comic books uh, about, you know, with Erica being the hero, and I already have two. So I'm working on the third one now. It's called Erica and the, and the Oreo Cookie Monster. Now, I really hope I'm not going to get sued for, you know, by Oreo. Uh, but uh, the idea is that an Oreo Cookie Monster, a big one, um, it takes over her school and uh, gets everyone to eat some Oreo cookies. And because they, you know, they're full of sugar, they get hypnotized and zombified. And the only one who didn't eat them is Erica. And then she uses broccoli, basically, to kick ass. And, uh, you know, she needs to get everyone to eat a piece of broccoli so they wake up from the trance. And that's how she defeats uh, the big monster, right? But you see, is that manipulative? Be Like, is that me being manipulative uh, for the sake of my daughter? Uh, accepting broccoli as a great um, nutrition choice, that is. I'm incorporating broccoli as a weapon. I am endorsing violence, right? I am putting my daughter above everyone in her school as the superior being, more intelligent and more powerful by making her into a superhero. Am I being manipulative? Of course I'm being manipulative. Um, is the, you know, is it justified? Like for me, as far as the result I'm looking to achieve? Absolutely. So I don't really mind being manipulative or admitting that I am for the sake of achieving the greater good, because I recognize that human nature is, uh, it is, is what it is. You know, if we're really honest about it and you, you know, you need to manipulate people into new ways of thinking. And if, again, think about the times when, um, there were just people riding horses and uh, then people like Henry Ford and, you know, a bunch of other people who were at the time working on cars, you know, invented the car, the carriage. Um, did they have to manipulate people to move away from horses? Do people, you know, who made their living thanks to breeding horses or otherwise uh, using horses for transport, you know, did they need to manipulate the public and try to convince them not to switch to cars? Yes, of course. And such is human nature, such is the world that we're living. And, you know, we just have to accept that. Like, I I see manipulation as just a gun, okay? Gun could be used to protect me, or it could be used to go in and and, uh, wreak violence and and havoc. So how I use the gun, up to me. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, manipulation in every form, storytelling, claim making, uh, selling of any kind, uh, it could be used either way. And depending on the kind of person you are, you're going to use it that way. Yo, it's Igor. If you're loving the content, hop on over to lizbillinglifestyleshow.com for more free training and a free transcript of this episode. 
Oh, and I'd really appreciate if you logged into iTunes and rated the show. It really helps. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point because I, I think about it and, and manipulation really has this negative connotation when, when you when you talk about it. But when you – like for example, um, I, I think of uh, – like, like we talk about uh, old military uh, – uh, you know, ads and stuff. I remember seeing an ad of where it had, it was directed obviously to young people getting ready to get out of high school or college and, and looking for what to do with their life. And it showed uh, a picture of a person who's uh, in the, in the, in, in half of their body split down the middle on the right side, they have a military uniform, a camouflage on their face, maybe a weapon or something. And then on the left side, split down their body, you see they're in a business suit with a briefcase, you know, and in, in, is that manipulation? I mean, you know, is, is it because that person might never end up being in corporate America wearing a business suit or, you know, being a stockbroker or whatever that connotates as far as being a lawyer or whatever. But I, I think maybe manipulation is maybe a word that maybe could be rephrased as uh, you're showing visions or uh, a, a frame. You're showing a frame of what the outcome could be with this. So you're showing uh, your daughter at basically her level, which is a, the level of a child. And they, they you know, they, they resonate with cartoons and, and kind of things like that that kids do resonate with. But you're showing an outcome that you have positive benefits from eating the broccoli over the cookies. And, and maybe uh, showing that picture of a uh, a young person, uh, you know, learning a technical ability and then getting uh, getting out and getting in corporate America or getting something that's deemed as successful, uh, you know, is it manipulation or is it just showing them a potential outcome by utilizing your product or utilize or following your sales copy? I think where we cross the line and, and people can debate this left and right, but when you cross the line and you show them something that's completely, you know, completely uh, – impossible, you know, or are highly improbable, you know, you can be an astronaut if you buy this course. Well, then I think that that is where we cross the line. I think that if you show realistic potential outcomes, uh, you know, in, in the way that you, you put together your copy and the way that you communicate and the stories that you put together, I, I think that's, that's ethical. So that's, I guess you're right. There is a thin line, there's a gray area, but there is definitely, you know, a positive ends. And then there's a definitely, uh, I mean, I, 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 in a negative side, there's, there's a, the, you know, the, there's the, there's the dark side and then there's a the light side in Star Wars terms. So yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying with that. Yeah, and, and we really just have to remember that old example of uh, imagine you've got a pill that, that cures cancer 66% of the time, two-thirds, right? That's your chances. And imagine you've got a neighbor who's got a daughter, 15 years old, she's got stage 2 cancer. Now, how manipulative are you allowed to be to get your neighbor to approve his daughter taking the pill? And then you can start making other arguments. How manipulative would you need to be or are allowed to be if your neighbor doesn't want for his daughter to take the pill, but his daughter wants the pill, right? Or, or vice versa. Can he be allowed to be manipulative to the daughter getting her to take the pill if she doesn't want to take the pill? And there's a million arguments like that. You see, the problem with uh, the word manipulation, especially if, that, if it's taken that negative uh, form, is there is no black and white. It is an absolute gray area. And, and the argument could be spun in many different ways, period. So this is literally between you and you. Like if you have any preconceived notions about um, what you need to say and do uh, to, to get that product into the hands of the people who are the best fit for the product, um, you will you will sabotage yourself. You will sabotage the market. You will sabotage on every level. And uh, what you mentioned about, you know, making the claims, right? So if you buy this course, you'll be an astronaut or you buy this course, you'll live until you, you're 150. So, you know, making outrage, outrageous claims like that is, is definitely not a good idea. It's outright lying. And lying is not the same as manipulation. And stating claims that are highly unlikely is also uh, not the same as, quote unquote, selling manipulation. Um, I think nothing wrong with you doing whatever you have to do to get that sale going without crossing the ethical lines, although there could be made an argument for you to move the ethical lines, right? The, what most people use as an ethical border is actually way, you know, uh, you know, way, way, like if they can move it way, way back and uh, their, their borders could be shifted. 
But, you know, nothing wrong with just offering a disclaimer. You know, in many in many emails that I write, especially the ones where I make outrageous claims like, oh, look at me making 27,000 one day or something like that, right? I know it's an outrageous claim and I don't want to give people the idea that they can, you know, just immediately expect the same results. So I say, these are my results. Your results may be better, worse, or same. Yeah, no. I get, I'm getting these results because I've invested so many years in marketing, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's a good idea, uh, and your lawyer will probably tell you it's a good idea to use disclaimers, but it also doesn't deter people from you, you know, your your copy or your marketing. It's just n- normal. Uh, they understand that disclaimers ought to be made, and they're intelligent enough to appreciate that. Plus, it makes you seem genuine. Like, if you genuinely state proud and cl- uh, proud you know, big, bold letters, disclaimers on everything you do, then um, they have no reason to disqualify you as uh, somebody who's full of shit. Because there you go. There's a big disclaimer right there on the page, in the video, you know, in the podcast, in the book, whatever. Um, You know, it's funny, by the way, because the one place where I'm noticing that you can say anything you want is a book cover. Did you notice that? A, A book cover? How so? Well, get on Amazon and see how many books there are with like outrageous claims. Claims that are just quite frankly crazy. And they're passing the whatever review um, they're supposed to be passing. Like the FTC never comes after you if you wrote a book that says how to make a million dollars in six days. But you can release a book like that and people will buy it. Well, that's a good point. I never really realized that. Maybe they're, they're thinking that you're going to open the book and then there's plenty of disclaimers in there. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I'm going to pay attention to that from now on, for sure. Yeah, I had no idea. I really don't. Like, there's no disclaimers in any of the books that I read. Um, and some people use pretty outrageous claims. Uh, and people accept that. So does it mean that context also determines whether or not you can be manipulative or, you know, outright lie to other people? Like, if you can, t- you know... Uh, the food industry, let's take that because this is a little bit more controversial. Um, anything they put on the label in the front is considered to be a title. This means that they can say anything. So even if they're like uh, packing um, chicken, right, and they, they can say it's organic, but it's not organic, and they get away with it because whatever's on the front is the, is the title of the product. Can you believe that? Mm, the title of the product. Wow, there's always loopholes. That's crazy. So, so I guess the, the 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 takeaway from this is that, you know, the 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 frame of the outcome, you know, is is really dependent on uh, on how you phrase it. Because I know that we're restricted, right? In marketing, we're restricted. Um, you're not going to be able to legally say certain things because there there'll be bold claims. You're going to get quickly kicked off marketplaces. You're going to get kicked quickly banned from uh, from uh, you know uh, email platforms. You're going to be open yourself up to liability of lawsuits and that kind of thing. So there's definitely protections out there and things that you know, not that it stops a lot of people, they still they still violate it, but there's definitely um, the legal ramifications to doing that as well. So um, that's something also to consider. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a reason why Facebook is so strict and everyone gets banned on Facebook all the time and why Averber bans accounts. And, and um, there's a reason for that uh, because they have lower tolerance for claims. But I also want to make an argument about their them having lower tolerance doesn't mean that the claims that are being made are bad, unethical, manipulative, or otherwise untrue. Because that's that, that's just, that actually opens a whole other door that we can probably discuss in, in, on a different show. And that is when you operate within the constraints of someone else's media, like Facebook, like Google, like Aweber, and etc., um, you're being told what you can and cannot say. So um, it's not as simple as making a claim and kind of deciding whether the claim is, is legit or not. It's more about what do they think about the claim. And uh, some platforms are more sensitive than others. You know, I can tell you that Facebook is very sensitive right now about so many different things. And I still see people clinging, you know, to Facebook so badly, although that's definitely not the best way to advertise anymore. And, uh, you know, we discussed it 
a couple of a uh, couple of shows ago how um you know there's like uh oh, this whole process that lasts 33 days and how you get back on facebook after you get banned you have to buy a new computer move to a new house you know oh that was crazy <laughs> you know get remarried change your address and, and it's like people still do that stuff for for no reason just because they they feel that facebook is the best place to go so yeah it's a totally different argument for me uh, but as far as selling manipulation, I think uh, we can wrap up with this one uh, last uh, story of this plumber who comes in to fix the pipe uh, for this uh, old lady. And, you know, she says, basically, the shower isn't working. You know, he steps into the shower, he sees a big pipe sticking out of the wall, and uh, he grabs a, grabs a crowbar and bam, you know, hits the, hits the pipe. All of a sudden, he hears a bunch of noises and you hear water running down the pipe. Bam, the shower works. And he, uh, you know, gives uh, the, the old lady the bill, $250. She looks at him and she says, are you kidding me? You just hit that pipe with your crowbar once and you expect me to pay $250 for that. To which he said, oh, okay, pulls out his notepad and writes down uh, $5, one crowbar hit on pipe. $245 knowing where to hit. So this makes an argument of is is it ethical of him to charge so much money for such a quote unquote small job? And you can say, no, it's not fair because it only took him so much time. And that's only a good argument if you value his his work based on the amount of time spent working. But what you don't recognize is how about him going to plumber school? Or whatever I don't know what plumbers do to get their you know degree or or paperwork. And what about him going through years and years and years of experience? And what about him dealing with all kinds of different problems and solving the issue efficiently? Or would you prefer for him to sit there for three hours, pretend he's working, you know, and uh, maybe make a big mess of it? So as far as I'm concerned, um, th there's uh, there's a lot of gray area here, and what people make out of manipulation is often not the case. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, because that's that's the same with a lawyer, same with uh, someone who's who's a, a technician of any sort repairing something. It's all that that time that and experience that they put into it that you're really paying for. So, not the act of them sending a piece of paper to the courthouse or whatever, you know. So I was looking over our show notes for this one, and I and I see that. Uh, you know, you did make a, a comment that I, I think that's really bears bears me just kind of bringing out is is that you don't sell, you don't push products that you're on a mission to free people from their problems. Can can you expand on that just a little? Yeah, absolutely. Typically, you you can't really build a business around something that doesn't help someone else get what they want, right? I mean, no one's just going to give you money just because. Um, even when people donate money, they do it to get a sense of some kind. Um, so if you're selling a product, whether your own or someone else's, and you're solving a problem of some kind, typically it, the statement would be true to say you're not selling products. You are in the business of solving blank problem, whatever that problem is. So, you know, this podcast and us hosting this podcast, we're in a business of helping people build lists to make money and to be free. Someone who's selling medical equipment to hospitals is in the business of improving society's health or improving healthcare for the elderly or whatever else. Somebody who's selling face masks, I think that's a very relevant example right now, is in the business of helping stop the spread of the virus, therefore preserving the lives of millions. Now, are these people opportunistic? if we can call them that way, when they sell each mask for 50 bucks or something like that. You know, that's been a big argument in the news, right? So, so they like sell gloves and they charge like five bucks per, per, per pair. Um, is that opportunistic? Is that evil? Is that um, manipulative? Is that, uh, you know, uh, profiteering? Probably. But for the last 60 years, when no one needed those gloves, they had to sell them at like a two cent, a two cent profit. So now they're really like, you know, profiting. And do they deserve it? That's up to you. What, what would you say if there was no a mask? Because if there was no gloves, uh, would you still say the same thing? I don't know. Uh, people complain about that and that's fine, but they still end up buying, you know, still end up paying the price. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's supply and demand. And now, I guess you're right. Uh, it's it's up to you know the society to decide whether 
what they're doing is ethical or fair or, or given the circumstances. But you're right, supply and demand. I mean, under, under any other circumstances, uh, if there's a lower supply and you have the demand, you're providing uh, something that people need and want, and they're going to buy it uh, at a price that they think is fair. So, yep, absolutely. Great show. I really enjoyed talking about manipulation, scamming versus uh, uh, selling. And there's really a distinction between the two, even though sometimes it's easy to, to blur. Thank you for listening to the Liz Building Lifestyle. Get access to previous episodes, the transcription of today's show, as well as other exclusive content at lizbillionlifestyleshow.com. Also, don't forget to claim your free seat at the workshop I'm hosting this week, where I show the two-step system that made me the top affiliate for people like Matt Basak, John Cristani, Richard Legg, Michael Cheney, and many, many others. In fact, on this workshop, I'm going to show you the exact approach I take whenever I promote an affiliate offer, the exact offers I promote, as well as how I was able to make over half a million dollars in commissions using my small list of just 18,000 people promoting a weird type of product that almost no one else promotes. All that is yours at igor.ac. So go ahead, claim your seat right now, and I'll see you there.